Visiting with Huell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Hi everybody, I'm Huell Hauser and welcome to a very special one hour edition of Visiting. Now this adventure came about through my friendship with Ranger Joe Zarkey who's with the Joshua Tree National Park. Joe invited me to come out to watch, uh, to see firsthand a project that you're involved right. with. And this thing has just kind of grown, hasn't it, Joe? That's right. Well, as we talked, we realized we had a lot more than just one project going on here, and many of them were very interesting, and you agreed to film them on. We really appreciate that. Well, we have we have spent two days. This is actually being taped at the end of our adventure, but this is kind of an introduction to invite you to sit back, turn on your air conditioner, and watch us sweat because we were out here <laughs> during two of the hottest days of the summer. But this park is a very, very special place and you're going to meet some wonderful people who volunteer in this park and help make it a better place for all of us. So here it is, the two hottest days I've ever spent in my life, but very <laughs> worthwhile you. out here at Joshua Tree National Park. The next night is a class four specialty night. It is a four-finger Prusik. You'll have 30 seconds to tie this knot. Pick tail right hand, pick tail left hand. Ready, begin. Now, what's happening out here right now? Uh, we're doing uh, knot tests. These are different knots they use in rock, uh, rock climbing and uh, rappelling and things like that. And to get them to practice these knots, we have to test them. And after about four weeks of teaching them the knots and then training on the knots, they uh, sit here and they take their test and it's either pass or fail. Now, why did you come out to this site for this test this morning? Well, Joshua Tree is some of the best climbing they have around here. Uh, you got all different sites. You have easy sites, hard sites. You got long rappels, like a 150 foot rappel over in this corner over here, and different climbs. Excuse me. Time! Drop your ropes. Wow. And so we get them time to uh, get uh, practice with the rock training as part of the engineer's mobility aspect of uh, being in the Marine Corps. And you're out here early because it's going to get to what, about 120 today? Well, we've been out here all week climbing, so <laughs> we're all pretty hot and, and, and sweaty right now. But it's a good place. It is to a very work. good place. Great place to and work. And the government lets you use. The park system lets you use the park anytime right, you want to use we, it. We pay like a normal customer. The money comes from our fund at the battalion to the Joshua Tree uh, National Park. Great, great. Okay, so you're going to be here for how much longer? Uh, we'll probably be leaving here about 1,300 today. Great. They're tying the knots. It's about 10 after 8, and it's already about 95 degrees. Okay, here we are. We are finally starting our program. You know that on our way to the campsite, we stumbled across a bunch of very hot Marines down there. It's just 8.30 in the morning, and it's already about, what would you say it is out here today? Um, 100 degrees. At least. At least. Okay, I'm standing with Jillian Bowser, and your official title here at Joshua Tree National Park, Park is? Park Ecologist. Park Ecologist. That's correct. And we are here, actually this whole program is devoted to interesting things that are happening in the park. And interesting things are happening here all year round, aren't they? Uh, it depends on how you define interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say they're happening all year round. We're looking at long-term management of the park. So how do we look at the park as an ecosystem? How do we preserve it and what animals do we look for uh -huh. to preserve the park? Okay, well, there are interesting things going on here today, um, and I think if we can prove that there are interesting things happening today with 120 degrees. 100, 100 even. Well, it's going to get, <laughs> see, you're a stickler. It's going to get close to 120, okay. don't you think? Close. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, where, you, where are you taking us? We're going to go out about a kilometer down this way towards the Back Canyons, which is a uh, Boy Scout trail, uh -huh. where we have a population of desert tortoises. Um, we have a crew of Earthwatch volunteers who are currently radio tracking the animals. So we can go in on a radio signal and find out where the animals are located and see if they're above or below ground. In this temperature, you're not going to see too much. They'll all be below ground. The tortoises, not the volunteers. Uh, they're working on getting below ground at this point. <laughs> They're pretty hot. <laughs> All right, you brought us out here. Look at this. This is this is part of the beauty of Joshua Tree National Park. These beautiful rocks that surround us uh, on all sides. And we're going to be seeing that a lot during our stay here. There's a lot of beauty here, isn't there? That's correct. There are also tortoises up in those rocks. Really? Yeah. We've got one that's probably about halfway up the cliffside. And a couple more that are in and out of the boulders. I don't know if we'll be able to get them out for you today. You know, They have to be out 
because according to Fish and Wildlife, we have to be careful on how we handle them and make sure we don't disturb them. Mm -hmm. But they, they burrow right in the rocks, right next to the rocks. We had one on top of the rocks, about 25 feet off the ground, on top of a boulder. Don't know what she was doing there. Really? Yeah, we can show you the boulder. She's not there right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. We're off in search of the elusive desert tortoise on this beautiful morning at Joshua Tree National Park. Now, right off the bat, you know, I love this park. I live out here in the desert mm -hmm. a lot of the time, and I, I love this. I'm, I'm in heaven right now. But a lot of people are gonna look at this right off the bat and say, it's just a pile of rocks, hot rocks out mm -hmm. in the desert. Well, it is a pile of hot rocks out in the desert, but the important part is to look at what grows in between the rocks, what grows under the rocks, what animals use the shade, the cool spots, how much water is pooled beneath the rocks. Yeah, as we're walking down through here, you can look and see how much activity is eaten around both the rocks and the trees. Now, this is the area that in the spring would have just been filled with wildflowers, too. Th this place was phenomenal in the spring. We were covered with wildflowers. If you look down here, all these dead shrubs and bushes were all in flower wow. in the spring. So there was a facilia that was purple from one end to the other. We had the chia, which is used by the Native Americans, was everywhere. It was just solid chia. Now we've... Who's this? These are our Earthwatch team members who are tracking the tortoises. Let's look at Alicia and Dave have come in to do tortoise tracking. Howdy. Hi. Did you find any tortoises? Yeah. How many? Um, we found five. Now I have yet, and Louie hasn't either, ever seen a desert tortoise. Really? Yeah. Well, do you, uh, <laughs> you want to go see one? <laughs> yeah. That's why else do you think we're wandering around out here in the middle of the desert? Where is the tortoise? You don't have one in that backpack, do you? Can't carry him out. <laughs> well, can you find one for us? Where do we go look for one? We can look on the sheet, the closest one. Can we, uh, really, we really do want to find one. And, and we love the park, but we don't want to hike. It's a pretty good hike. That's where we just came from. We just got the five down there. So you found five. This is what you find them with? How does that work, Jillian? Well, the idea is that the tortoises have a transmitter on their back, and what she's holding is called a receiver, which receives a signal from the transmitter. So when she holds the antenna up, it picks up a, a beep, which tells you where the animal is, and you can tune it so it only picks up a narrow frequency, and you can use that to focus into where the animal is. And why do we need to know where these desert tortoises are? You've got to track what their population is, how they're doing. We just had a two-year drought. This year they had a lot of rain. You know, what impact does that have on a tortoise in the and desert? Are you finding out anything? Yeah, we've learned a lot in two weeks. <laughs> well, share some of that knowledge with us. Well, we just learned a lot about, uh, you know, desert habitat, uh, plants, what they might be eating. I mean, these guys don't eat for a year sometimes. Yeah. So what's available, where the water sources are, they don't even care. Yeah. I mean, we just saw one that's 90 years old today. 90? That's what they how guesstimate. Do you, how do you age a tortoise? How do you know how old a tortoise is? Well, you only guesstimate by how many rings they've laid down on each individual scoot. But on a bad year, they may not lay down a full ring, or on a good year, they may not lay down several. So it's only one estimate. And when they get older, the shells start to smooth out. So the one who's 90, we actually had Dr. Christine Berry come up, and she's the one who guessed that the animal's age was around wow. 90. But he looks like black onyx, because he's almost completely smooth. He has Can no we ring. find that one? I believe we Do you know where that old guy is? Yeah, he's on the, let's look on the sheet. And then we'll, uh, Can we go? Would you mind going to look for it? You don't mind walking. It's hot. No, no. <laughs> Where are you from, by the way? I'm from Jersey right now. And so, what's the guy from Jersey doing out wandering around the California desert? Uh, well, I'm a school teacher, science teacher, and uh, sign up with Earthwatch to sound like a great two weeks in the summer, you know? And so, was it worth it? Oh, definitely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Vermont. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must think, what do you think about this? I think it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just the kind of story Louie and I like. Come on, let's go. Now, this is exciting. <laughs> it really is. We've, found, we've stumbled across a desert tortoise. That's correct. This is, this is the way we normally find them. We see a burrow or an opening, and we usually check all the burrows and openings. We use mirrors to check to see, and you can see in the back of the burrow if you look real careful, you can see the animal uh -huh. in there. This is a nice burrow. Sometimes they turn, and you can't always see all the way back. If it turns, we'll actually tap a, a nice-looking burrow and see if we see signs of an animal in there or hear something scuffing around. 
Uh, this is unusual in that we're in this area a lot and we're not sure yet who this animal is, so we will actually take it out of the burrow. Normally, you know, Fish and Wildlife stipulates that we only move the animal from the burrow once or when we need to service the transmitters. So we've lucked, we've just by luck, we were walking up here, you looked across, we didn't even have our cameras on, and, right. and spotted this burrow. Right, well, when, every time we walk in and out of the site, we always say we need fan out and then we check burrows. Because yeah. the animals are hard to see. And if you look at this burrow, it's buried under this um, yeah. Mormon tea. Oh my oh, gosh. Man. My first desert tortoise. <laughs> I've been looking for these darn things for years. You want to keep her low to the ground. Okay. Oh my gosh. Turn it around so we can see it. Keep her low. And the first thing we want to do is get her into the shade. So we should have, maybe David, if you can I'll set up. There. Yeah, a place to keep her in the shade. Actually, right over here looks like a good place to process her. Yeah. So she's in the shade. You walk her low to the ground. Really low to the ground. And oh my the gosh. Keep Look at this, Louie. If we go over here, we can probably... Can you turn it around this way? Because this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience for me. These things are elusive. They don't want you to find them, do they? Usually, well, they spend a lot of time underground. Um, they spend a lot of time out early in the morning, so you're often not out when they're out. You can go ahead and hand, put her down. No, she's going to go down. She's going to move. What you can do is you put her down. I don't have gloves on. Put your hand right in front of her nose. You want some gloves, give me? Yeah, give me some gloves, and she, she'll stop. Just put your hand right in front of her gooler. I mean, pass me gloves. Now, one thing we need to do is we need to handle her very quickly so we can reduce the time she's out of the burrow. So I'll record data. Is this an old one? This is quite an old female. Let's keep her in the shade. Now, here's what you're doing right here. This is an antenna. Well, this is, no, this is the antenna. Yeah. And this is an antenna. This is a transmitter. So uh -huh. this is transmitting a frequency. All the hardware is here, and all this stuff is battery. So and this you're going to put this on the back of the tortoise? That's correct. What keeps that from coming off? Uh, we use a lot of epoxy. Um, we try and mount the epoxy so it's easily removable from the animal. Yeah. Um, and then this battery lasts for about 36 months, so we can track the animal for almost three years yeah. and get collect data on how... How they move, right, where how, they are. Right, where they're... More importantly, we look to see you know, how big their range is, how many burrows they use, and what type of habitat they're using. And why do you need to know this? Well, a couple of things. You want to find out how many tortoises are in the park and where are they, because for tortoises, is one of the vital signs of the desert. It tells you how the desert is doing. So the torch itself is just one symbol of how we're doing you. in terms of protecting the desert. So that's part of our management concern is to find out how the tortoises are doing. Okay, you're going to put it on there. And, and as we've got a crowd gathered here, we found a tortoise. All right, great. One that had never been found before. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. You know? This is a major hotspot for the tortoises. Uh, we find a lot in the wash here and just west uh -huh. of the wash. This is one of our populations we need to keep an eye on. Uh, unfortunately, this population has shown signs of disease, uh, upper respiratory tract disease. So we need to monitor them and make sure they're all good and uh, keep it from spreading. You know, it's kind of exciting when you find one, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's great. Been working here a year and a half, and every time it's just like it's like the first one. Yeah, and this old grizzle guy here, are you excited? <laughs> Absolutely. Are you a volunteer? Absolutely, volunteer. From? From Yukaipa. Oh, okay, so you're local. I'm local. These other two we met are from I, New I Jersey and, right. and Vermont. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and They're curious, one, aren't they? They really are. Uh, a lot of times they'll just walk out to you uh, when you come up to their burrow. You know, after, even after you process them, they come back and they, they want to see what's going on. I don't know if they're looking for mates or water. They're just curious, like yeah. I said. Now, here we go. We got the tortoise, and we're keeping it low. It's got its transmitter on, and we're putting it back in its burrow. Right, we like to uh, put the tortoises back exactly as we found them. Uh, to keep this as minimum of an impact as possible to them. Uh, as you see there, she's heading back. She looks good, uh, the work looks good, she looks happy, or healthy. What do you mean, she looks happy? <laughs> I'm, I'm, being, I'm anthropomorphizing here a little bit. <laughs> she's doing a good thing for her species. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the way we have to Because she is helping to... Uh, she's helping us track the species and monitor, and we're trying to get a, a grasp on how big the population is and help preserve their habitat and bring them back to a stable level. Now, what do you say to people who say there's been too much made out of these desert tortoises, that 
we're paying more attention to them than we need to, that right, it's the right. tail wagging the dog. You've heard all well, the I arguments. I say it's an indicator of habitat. If you lose a tortoise, I mean, how can you, how can you say we're going to preserve other things? You know, we're trying to preserve a national park here. We're tr trying to preserve a species. If, if the tortoise is in bad shape, we're in bad shape. Yeah. So it's all interrelated. It's, it's that whole chain of it's interconnection. Ecology. We're all, yeah, it's all related. Well, okay, we got everything we needed. Now, Jillian, you were telling us that there's a program that, that people can, can uh, sign up and be a part of? That's correct. Um, ten, ten, Ken Tinkrist of the Joshua Tree Natural History Association has an adopt a tortoise transmitter program. So anyone can sign up and they, what they actually do is they adopt a tortoise. Uh -huh. And they pay the price of the transmitter, we put the transmitter on the animal. And what we do is we send them information and updates. They get photographs of their animals. Brent makes nice little maps of their animals. Kind of like your adopt a whale program. You don't get the whale in your backyard, but you get all the You get a picture of your own tortoise. Picture of your own tortoise. Can we turn the transmitter on? We should be able to hear this tortoise oh, yeah, now, shouldn't we? Loud and clear. So let's turn that thing on. So that's the new one. There she is. And any, in the future, anybody that walks by this area and has the transmitter turned, this antenna turned in that direction, will pick up this tortoise. Right, well she probably has five or six other burrows in this area, so she may not be right here, but right. she's probably somewhere in this area, and that's right. what we'll actually use this to track where she actually is at. Well, this is the group that chose to spend their vacation in the desert instead of in traditional vacation ways, and they mean a lot to the park, don't they? Oh, absolutely. We couldn't do it without them, funding-wise and help-wise. We've had excellent teams, and I'm sad it's their last day here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss them all. But we're having a big party tonight. That's right. We're having a party tonight. <laughs> That's right. We work hard and we play hard. That's, That's it. Right. <laughs> the park service life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have left our tortoise experience this morning, Ernie. I'm now visiting with the park superintendent and Ernie this has been a we've already had a great time this morning you know we found a tortoise named it Huell I've adopted it terrific, terrific. and that means that I send in two hundred and fifty dollars to the park association is that right that's correct that uh, that goes towards the, the cost of the transmitter that was placed on the tortoise the one that you found today uh-huh and, and in return for that you'll get a certificate a picture of the tortoise and all of the data that comes with it, you know, size, weight, sex, all that, in a nice little packet. Well, this is very exciting. And, you know, we've still got a lot of adventures uh, yet ahead of us on this particular trip. Uh, we just happened to be here on the hottest two days of the year. I was wondering about your timing there. It is <laughs> about 115 degrees today. Yeah, <laughs> in the shade. In the shade. But we're here because the heat is part of what Joshua Tree is all about. And... Yep. We have some, some wonderful footage that we're going to show now that you have kindly given us. We, we might point out that we're now at an oasis. That's great. This is the 29 Palms Oasis. This is what the town of 29 Palms was named after. And this is where the early settlers first, uh, when they were traveling through here, uh, would stop because of the water that was here. And um, water is, this is one of the few places where water actually comes to the surface. Can we stand over here in the shade while we're... You're the superintendent. You can get us in the shade, can't you? <laughs> you can make some and actually, here. there's water back here, too. There's actually water in here. That's correct, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the park, um, about this park, because it really is a real treasure here in California. It is. Uh, the California desert is, is a unique place. Joshua Tree National Park is just a small portion of, of the great Mojave and the Colorado deserts that make up this uh, southern portion uh, of California. Uh, it's unique in the sense Joshua Tree is, is special. It's where you can dramatically see where the high Mojave Desert and the low Colorado Desert merge. There's a, there's a, there's a range. Um, uh, when you drop down into the Pinot Basin, it's called Gold Point, you can see dramatically the difference when you come up from one uh, desert and drop down into the another. You have different ecosystems here. That's correct, yeah. Everything from oasis ecosystems to uh, we have the, uh, the bajadas, uh, the alluvial fans. We have uh, great open uh, valleys, uh, mountains. The, the park ranges in elevation anywhere from about 1,500 feet up to uh, about 5,500 feet. So, really? Yeah, tremendous range. 
And you have people coming here literally from all over the world. That's what I find interesting when I come out here. I'm always running into people from, especially Europeans, who believe it or not, love to be out here in the dead of summer. Yeah. This the summer is a time, obviously, when it's extremely warm, as we're finding out today. But it's also the time when our international visitors choose to come to visit not only Joshua Tree, but from here they'll go into Death Valley, which is even a little bit warmer. But they do get a true sense and feel for what the desert's all about. So, how big is this park? The park is 796,000 acres, roughly. Mm -hmm. So it's a big park. Oh, it is uh, significant. Yeah. It, a lot it, of visitors. A lot of visitors. A uh, million two hundred plus. And. A lot of those are local visitors who have kind of grown up in California, uh, just like you, a local guy, yeah. who keep coming back as part of kind of a family tradition. To They've been coming here really for generations to camp, to climb rocks, to do what sort of thing? Well, we have um, people will stop in and uh, the visitor center will engage in conversation. They'll tell me that their their parents used to take them camping out here or their ga grandparents used to have a cabin and homestead out here. So there's, there's that attachment that's carried on to their children which now enjoy the park. Uh, it's, it's terrific. So you have a lot of people who have come and been coming here for generations. You're having a lot of foreign visitors. You're having a lot of newcomers to California who are discovering the park mm -hmm. for the first time. And then the reason we're here really is to talk about the the way the park interacts with the communities, with the people of California. Our, our, we have a significant volunteer program, everything from mounted equestrian volunteers to the tortoise group that you work with this morning. So yeah. people can come in and use their time and their energy to hook into to any way they want to help the park? Exactly, there are a number of ways. We even have, we have camp host, we have individuals that come and help us out at the visitor center. Uh, arts in art in the park program, where artists come here and they'll stay for two weeks. They'll we give them a place to kind of get away from the the mainstream of uh, all of the activity, just to concentrate and do their artwork. And in return, they share the art with with the rest of the community. It really is one of the wonders of of the park is that it interacts so nicely with the community as well. The community just butts right up to the park. Well, it does. We have tremendous community support for the park. The, the high desert communities as well as the communities in the low desert in the Coachella Valley. Uh, everything from uh, individuals wanting to volunteer. Uh, tonight you'll meet some of the volunteers that'll be doing the, uh, that has helped with the bat surveys. These are individuals that just, we put a call out on the radio for people to come out, bring a chair and sit in front of a cave opening and, and count bats as they come out. So, <laughs> Well, that's what we're going to be doing tonight. I know this is going to keep the viewers riveted to the screen. <laughs> we, right. We've done a tortoise this morning, yeah. a bats this afternoon. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Bahada Trail tomorrow with right. the uh, YCC and the Telephone Pioneers. And the Ravens. And the Raven Studies. That's right. That's the high school groups. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the oasis back there. There is water in there. But why would we want to spend time in a cool place with water when we could sit out in front of a mine and look for bats? <laughs> that's exactly so right. that's where well, we're going. Well, thank you. You're going back to your office. I'm going back to where it's There's cool. the park yeah. headquarters right over there. And uh, well, I can't say enough about it. We've made a lot of fun of the heat, but that, that's really part of the adventure and we're loving it. That's we're pacing ourselves. We're drinking lots of water. Louie's got on a hat just like mine. Good. And uh, we're taking care of ourselves. That's terrific. We hope you do, Hill, because we need you and Louie around <laughs> for, for some time to come. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Joshua trees, big rocks, heat. We're heading for the bats. Well, it's about five minutes to seven, and where are we exactly? Well, we're near the Pine City Backcountry Board, the uh, Desert Queen Mine is behind us uh -huh. at the base of that escarpment out there. We're high in the park here at Joshua Tree National Park. And you can tell we're high up because we're having a cold snap right now. It's only 97 degrees. It's well below 100 in my book. Yes, and compared to where we were this morning with those tortoises, this is, look, there's a breeze blowing. It's going to be a great evening, and you all know what you're in for, don't you? Oh, yeah, we've done this. Again and again and again. <laughs> Several times. Well, try to show a little more enthusiasm. We're trying to get people excited about this thing. Well, we've been doing bat surveys since about April. Okay. This group has. They've done hundreds more than I have. 
And uh, this is one of the sites we surveyed. We found quite a few bats here. Yeah, we're looking for bats. Now, I know this is a real ratings. This is the people are going to be glued to the set when they hear it's a this. It's contest. It's a contest. Now, well, yeah. it's hard to beat desert tortoise. That's a threatened and endangered species. Um, they got a lot of, they're uh, photogenic, that's for sure. And bats are kind of creepy to most people, but yeah. we love them. So. Well, let's go look for the bats. And as we head up, we'll talk a little bit about why we're doing this. Uh, this is all very exciting, and it's part of the adventure and the ever-changing stories that are found all over this wonderful national park, Joshua Tree National Park. And I never thought I'd be hiking around it in this kind of weather with my destination being a bat cave, but that's where we're heading. <laughs> and uh, actually, it's a beautiful time of the day. It's what they call, I think, the magic hour, isn't it? Well, sun up and sun down in the desert are just beautiful, and the temperature is really quite pleasant. It was about 115 at my office at noon today, so now it's quite, quite nice, and uh, you get a beautiful sunset, and the stars come out, and hopefully we'll see some bats. Look at these colors, Louie. Look at these colors. This is absolutely, this is what the desert is all about. These wonderful, rich colors, everything, everything really larger than life out here, isn't it? Well, this is one of the many things that are protected under National Park Service management is a vista like this, which is unintruded by uh, buildings or roads or works of man. I see it. At least I see the tailings. That's the mine. Well, that's a waste rock pile. Tailings are what comes out of the milling process. Oh, OK. And this is the Desert Queen mine. Uh, Bill Keyes owned this mine, and it operated up into, I think, about the 60s. Uh -huh. And there's quite a bit of workings here. You can see where these uh, oh, look, protective these, closures have been installed. All of these closures were part of the old well, exits that, to the mine. That's right. Those are the portals to these adits, and adit is like a tunnel. You see there's one under that huge rock oh, there. Oh, look at this, Louie. You can see it rock. right over here under the big, under the big rock right here, where two of our members have already gone ahead of us and are climbing over. So these hills are just honeycombed with old mines, aren't they? That's right. This is a major contact zone of uh, an intrusion from uh, molten rock below and in those contacts formed quartz crystals. And the crist crystals were often uh, gold-bearing. And uh, uh, these miners would prospect those openings and, and follow those, those uh, dikes or veins after the gold. And what they left behind was a tunnel, which is exactly like a cave. Ah, and the bats. That's where there's bats. Now, how many mines were there through where the park is now? Hundreds? Well, uh, we've identified 280 really? abandoned mine sites within the park. So there was a lot of gold mining going on up here. There was a real gold rush here after the, the 46ers and the, and 49ers. the 49ers and the 96ers. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, the heat gets to all of us. That's okay. <laughs> Come on, lot, let's keep going. Numbers. Let's keep going. Now we're at the entrance to one of the shafts, and boy, there is a lot of very cold air coming out of here. There's there's a an outblow of air on this adit, which indicates that it's probably quite extensive, and it probably connects to another opening somewhere. I'm gonna stand over here a little and bit closer <laughs> to it. Now tell us about these things. Why they're here? Well. After this mine was abandoned, people continued to enter it, and it's a dangerous opening. There's, there, the, it could collapse. There could be hazards in there like poisonous gases or who knows what might happen to you. So to keep people out, we put this closure up. However, it's not a bat-friendly closure because bats can't fly through it. But in the interim, or in the meantime, people have have chipped out yeah, openings along the so edge. Yeah, we can see that. They can just, people could just so sneak. The people are still going in. And bats may be going in and out, but it's not a real bat-friendly gate. A, a bat gate would have big openings. And that's the gate that's back in there. Well, that's another, that's another people gate. That's a stainless steel cable net. Oh. And that's not real bat-friendly either. So we want to know if bats are using this mine and if we should change this to a more bat-friendly 
gate. Do you think there are a lot of bats in there now? Well, we know that there's bats flying in the wash here. And we know that this would be really good bat habitat. If I were a bat, I'd want to be in there right you, it, it, you would. So we're going we're gonna to set up with this uh, survey tonight okay. and see if we can catch bats going in or out or see if we get them in the, in the uh, opening. And, and that's the cue for this gentleman to show us this. I've never seen anything like this. What is this? This is a Mini 3 uh, bat detector. A bat detector. And how does it work? Well, it works on, uh, what it does is it slows down a bat's talk or, or chat, chat d 10 times so people can hear it. And it works from 20 to 160 kilohertz. So, I think 20 kilohertz now. You can so if bats that. fly by here, what do you do? Just sit here and aim it toward the... Well, we'll aim it towards the front of the uh, entrance of the mine. And then we'll rotate it back and forth to try to pick up the different frequencies because several different bats have different frequencies. So you're echolocating at about 40 kilohertz. Uh -huh. Some bats come in at 120 and some come in at at just 20. You're losing me, but I, I get the idea. Well, you know how a bat finds its way through the dark is it, it emits a call, and that call reflects off of surfaces back to it, and that's called echolocation. And then you write all this down? You yeah, keep, where's you the, keep, we have a data uh, sheet. We have a data sheet, and you all uh, sit here and do what? Well, we, we chart what we see and hear. So we watch for visual bats as long as it's light enough and we can see them silhouetted against the sky. We listen to the electronic bat detector and we actually chart them, one, two, three, four. Wow. And we, we chart the time and um, direction and and, and... and how exciting does this get for you up here? <laughs> it's real exciting. How Even... many bats come through here on a good night? Well, I haven't personally been to this mine before, so I'll get to find out tonight. But how many bats would be a good bat count? for a night? A hundred. A hundred? A thousand? Two hundred? Mm, we've seen as many as 30 a night up to 50 at the contact. So it just varies. A lot of things like your temperature and your wind. If we got too high a wind, this tells us our wind speed. Uh -huh. If the wind speed is too high, the bats are not going to be out because it's too hard for them to fly in the wind. Wow. So but there's also, a lot to know about all of this. Well, it's certainly a science and the difficulty was we have 280 some mine sites and we needed to systematically do surveys on them, but I'm just one biologist. That's where the volunteers come in. <clears throat> That's where the volunteers came in. So we... how did they hook you all into being bat volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> he advertised on the radio and, and uh, we have enjoyed this park for a lot of years and we just thought it was really a good opportunity to, to be part of what was happening here and something that was important and we just really enjoy coming out here in the evenings. Wow. Yeah, it's been a really fun thing to be able to give something back to the park that's meant so much to us. We met here, so it's special. You met? Yeah. Not in this <laughs> actual spot no. with bats <laughs> flying over you, but no. in a more romantic Absolutely, way. Absolutely, much more romantic. It was wow. a campground. <laughs> wow, this is great. So that's our volunteer story here. Yeah. And now I guess we just all sit here and wait for when's the best time for bats? Right well, now? just about sundown, we do our service. Are we scaring them? I mean, we, we, you have to be quiet? Well, well, we'll quiet down a little bit and move away from the opening, and we've kind of got a system. Wow, this yeah, is exciting. Are, this is... Really good. It's, a, it's a good time for quiet contemplation, because you need to sit quietly, work your detector, search the skies, and see if bats come out. Now, right now, bats hear us and, and sense a predator. So they're laying low. So we're going to have to sort of back off here and set up. And uh, if we get an outflight from here, they'll be coming fast because that's when they're subject to predation well, is right really at the Will we be portal. able to see them with the camera? Um, if you're fast. M yeah. you, most of them, we had up way here. more detections with the bat detector than we did have visual observations. You will see them they're, uh, outlighted up in the sky. But yeah. you very seldom. They move quickly. <laughs> about 40 miles an hour. You all aren't doing something like bringing us on a snipe hunt, are you, or something like that? I mean, there really are bats back in there, aren't there? That's a real thing. <laughs> we hope so. It's getting just about bat time now. The sun's, the sun is set. We're in that about five minutes before it actually gets dark. So, Louie, Chris says it's just about bat time. Good batting time right now. Here I'm rolling this machine back and forth between 20 and 160 megahertz. 
because if you leave it at one spot, you only pick up one bat species which speaks at that particular frequency. So if we hear that, we know there's a bat flying by. Yeah, it's a real distinct sound. It sounds very much like that. It's kind of a series of clicks and a chatter. And it's once you heard it once, it, you never mistake it again. So, so Chris, tell me the truth. Do you think we're going to see a bat tonight? <clears throat> well, what's your, what's your guess? I'm pretty certain that we'll see something in the wash. Whether we get something come out of the, out of the mine is a little, a little iffy. You never really know. How long do we sit here? Midnight? Two o'clock, daybreak. There's one. There goes a bat. I see him. See him He's up over the horizon. Yeah. Oh, wow. Bats need a place to live. Bats roost in the evening. They have maternity colonies, and they hibernate. And they do that in caves. And since many of the caves have been destroyed here by uh, development, human expansion, and population growth, um, some of these artificial habitats act like a natural habitat, which may have been destroyed. And bats are good. Oh yeah, bats are real good. They don't get stuck in your hair, and uh, they don't generally carry diseases. They eat insects, and they're very, very clean. And, and they're part of the food chain. They're part of the chain of life, oh, just sure. like the tortoises that we saw this morning. Everything out here is a, a part of the chain of life, and, and bats definitely are. They prey upon insects, they eat fruit, they pollinate plants. And then other things like owls or, or rats prey upon them, which are preyed upon by other animals. And so it's all, it's all part of that rich tapestry of nature. Well, Louis said he got some quick pictures of some of the bats. We'll slow those down, and then we'll put some pictures of bats on the air. But whether our viewers realize it or not, we really did see bats out here tonight. And... I hope we all understand and appreciate now that bats are all part of the cycle and are very important and that all of these old mines that years ago were used to make fortunes from with the human element interjected here are now being recycled and hopefully reused for things like bat habitat. Well, we Did don't, I say that correctly? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Um, this area was exploited for profit in the past, and now it's being used by bats for a home. So, uh, and that's very valuable to us. Uh, and our volunteers are really helping us out with this job here. Well, so the volunteers are spread out all over the place. Here's one of them down here. He's still got his bat detector pointed toward the cave. There's another one over here, and we got three or four others up on top of the hill. Yeah, I got one. There he is. I think it's too dark, but we can hear him. Yeah, you can hear him. That's yeah, 45 kilohertz. That was an overhead flight. I was pretty well, pretty sure of that because he didn't get it coming out of the cave. I got it going overhead. Well, with, I think without this detector, we'd have never seen that. We'd have been yammering along here and and had no idea that. This bat has flew been exciting here. for us, but boy, I tell you, it's really something to stand next to you. You really get excited when you. Get... Oh yeah, sure. It's like hunting. <laughs> You're just hunting for bats. Well, here we are, it's Saturday morning, and after a good night's sleep in front of an air conditioner last night. <laughs> but you all camped out, didn't you? Uh, we slept on the ground last night with the coyotes. <laughs> well, but that's good. That gets the kids into the whole idea of what Joshua Tree National Park is all about, right? Well, when I woke up, they were on the tabletops. They really were. <laughs> yeah, there were quite a few of them on the tabletops. <laughs> all right, I'm standing here with... Ray Panici from Capistrano Valley High School. And you teach... I teach biology and computers in the Academy of Technology and Math Science. Okay, now we ran across each other a couple of months ago and you had some of your students with us. Tell us what this is all about in the park. Well, I ran into the park ecologist about a year and a half ago and she had mentioned that they had um, a huge controversy going in with this landfill over in, in this direction in, uh, near Desert Center, uh, Eagle Mountain uh, Landfill. And it, she had a project with no funding and it, you know, I had some students who were scientists or wanted to be scientists and we could come out and help them. So I volunteered the kids, and uh, we've been here for a year and a half going out here and collecting data on the ravens. How does it feel to be volunteered for the raven? Did, what? 
He does it all the time. <laughs> okay, now what kinds of things do you all do out here? Um, we just normally stop every mile and a half, get out for 10 minutes, and look for anything that moves, and also etc. Okay, so you, what do you mean you look for anything that moves? Ravens, tortoises, lizards, any reptiles, tortoise shells, anything out of the ordinary. So really, Ray, you're just documenting what's out here on the desert floor in any particular area? Yeah, I think that the scientists want us to look in every direction, uh, laterally, horizontally, on the ground, and also in the sky, of course, because we're looking for birds. And the point is, uh, we're going to set baseline data for whether ravens are going to come in after the landfill goes in, if it goes in, because it's still up in the air, uh, and then we'll have a comparison. Landfill goes in, are the ravens up, are the tortoise populations going down, then we know the effect is the ah, landfill. Because the ravens eat the baby tortoises. Uh, they've been doing that for thousands of years, but there aren't many out here, as you'll see today. It's a little hot. Not and many not, ravens out here. Not many ravens out here. And uh, it's a little hot, lack of water, lack of food. Landfills provide permanent water, permanent food. So that would bring a lot of ravens into this area. It's a potential hypothesis. We're working on hypotheses. We want the kids to understand, you know, that it may or may not be true. And we're going to go out here and, and provide that data. You all found anything? Yeah. yeah what did you find? Uh, a whiptail lizard, uh, about this uh, big. Where is he? <laughs> How in the world did you? Because he was crawling across the ground. And oh, I saw I him got move. You. Once Who... he got under the bush, he's hard to see now. Who spotted him? Uh, me, about an inch and a half. Well, you're walking right by the coyote poop. Oh, coyote poop. Or feces, as we would say in the science classroom. All right, so now do you? I think another term is scat. Yeah. That's do you record this? Uh, we will remark that in our, our papers, but um, the coyotes are not something that we really need to. to Thank be you for pointing that out. Yeah. I didn't want to step in that. <laughs> we've got now. They look like they found something else. I think the kids actually get into this, don't they? Oh yeah, this is July. I mean, it's July. There's no school in. There's no, they're not getting credit for this. They're just out here to volunteer. A lot of them have taken ownership of the park, and they just think it's the neatest thing that we're out here preserving this park, or at least helping preserve it for uh, all Americans to come out here. And a lot of foreigners, too, I'll tell you. <laughs> what have we found over here now? It's gone well, already. What was it? You're too late. <laughs> Another lizard. Boy, you're good at spotting No, it's hers. It was hers. You yeah. spotted it? Yeah, but it's gone now. Turned around to call Evan, and it disappeared. Do you know what kind it was, Kim? Um, I don't know, but it was green and black on the sides. So and how striped. big was it? It was an adult, probably about that big. So you can record six. that. Big, I didn't really see the tail. It was like hidden. Well, but an alligator lizard or a whiptail lizard? We'll, we'll an alligator or whiptail lizard? Yeah, we'll have to get a book back at the camp and have her ID it. Kind of like see, a that police mystery. Way over there. How far do you go to? Well, he's kind of new in our group. We're just gonna let him go. <laughs> <laughs> they really get into this. Oh, they love it, and uh, what a beautiful place to be, even in the summertime, uh, when it's 110, 114, the rocks are just gorgeous. Do they get credit? No. In school? No. This is part of the academy program where we're providing opportunities for them beyond the normal school experience. Uh, some of these kids are working at Unisys Corporation, shadowing engineers, um, watching how people work in marketing, relations, doing all kinds of stuff. They work with computers all the time. We've got a computer with a GPS back here. And, uh, we've got a website we're building for the park on Justice Raven data. So, um, you know, it's part of their experience. We're trying to tell them there's more to school than sitting in a desk yeah. for, you know, an hour a day in a classroom. Right. This is their, their classroom. Well, we are ending up our Joshua Tree National Park adventure here. Actually, Joe, this is in the Colorado desert. This is the southeastern part of the park. That's right. Yeah, the Colorado desert is a branch of the Sonoran Desert that sort of spills over here into southeast California. Because most of the park is Mojave. That, that's this right. is Colorado desert. That's right. Mojave, you have the Josh trees. Down here in the Colorado desert, we don't have Josh trees. Boy, it is beautiful. And driving over here from our last location where we met with Ray and his students right. from San Juan Capistrano, I kept thinking, boy, I wish I'd had a science teacher like him when I was in school. He yeah. really motivates those kids out here in the park. He sure does. Yeah, we're really lucky to have Ray come out here and help us out. And how important is Ray and, and, and his volunteers, his kids, how important are they to the park, well, really? One, one of the things Josh Tree lacks is just real good, solid information about the plants and animals and things that, that live here. And Ray and his kids are helping us gather what's called baseline data. This is information that we can use to uh, 
look at changes in the environment over time. So that's really important from a scientific standpoint so you know what's going on in your park. And just to have them here is important. That's right, that's right. And the experience for the kids too. I mean, they're getting hands-on uh, knowledge, gained through experience that you just don't get in a textbook in a school. Yeah. Well, we got some more hands-on stuff going on over here. Sure this, is, this is the part of the adventure that initially got us here. You invited me a couple of months ago to come here and and watch this being done. What are we seeing here? Well, we have a project going on to build a new uh, self-guided nature trail here in the park. And this is what we're calling an all-access trail. It's designed in such a way so that uh, all people, whether they have physical handicaps or, or not, could come and use the trail and learn about the plants and the animals and the things that are here. And who are these ladies under here sweating? <laughs> you all didn't know what you were getting into, did you? No, but it's been great. We're from the Telephone Pioneers, Pacific Bell. Uh-huh. And you're coming out to, you volunteer your time to come out and... We volunteered our time to come out and help with the Nature Trail, along with a lot of our other projects. Now, you can't get out there in your wheelchair today because it's still under construction and you'd get stuck right out here. But eventually, wheelchairs will be able to go out onto this nature trail. That's the idea. I went out there and got yeah. stuck, so I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you won't get stuck in a couple of months uh, when this thing is the finished. Idea. The idea. Um, this particular uh, surface that they're putting on here, the road oil, uh, is something new and it, it hardens the surface of the sand without making it look like yeah. it's a big, you know, asphalt. concrete or something, yeah. asphalt trail. It'll be very natural looking and yet people like Wendy or people with visual um, handicaps or disabilities should be able to use this trail. If you go out there further, you'll see little pieces along the trail that are designed to let people know that they're coming upon an exhibit or a rest area. So and how is this state of the art here? Is this going to be uh, a trail that people are going to know about? We're going to hear a lot about it? It's not only state of the art, it's also very practical. This, this surface, it, um, it blends in with the natural surroundings so we're not asphalting the wilderness here. We're, we're providing good drainage where, and people will be able, all people will be able to access this uh, really unique desert spot. Do you anticipate that a lot of people are going to use this? A lot of people will be here in wheelchairs and... Yeah, because people stay away because they don't know they can go. When they find out they can, they go. Uh-huh. We've done about, this is the 152nd project we've done all around the country. You find as we do them, the more we do it, it's kind of like, if you show them the way, they will come. Yeah. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> yeah. Well, can we come? We'll, we'll rejoin you in just a minute. Come on, Joe. Sure. Come on out here because there's another element here as well. Um, well, this is the first, we're walking over the bridge. Excuse us, you're working hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? Well, I'm filing the edges so everything won't be sharp and it'll be round and smooth. Uh huh. I just do what Rocky tells me to do. <laughs> I got you. Rocky is the head guy somewhere out here. Way over there with the Ranson. Okay, and you're out here. Did you know what you were getting into? Oh, yes, I did. I've been out here already three times. So Really? I already know exactly what I'm doing. So it kind of grows on you. Yeah, it sure does. It's awful hot, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. You're not telling us anything. Nothing new, right? Had you been in the park before? Did you know anything about Joshua Tree? Uh, yes, I have. I've been coming out here for the past 15, 20 years. Yeah. And I've enjoyed every minute of it every time I've come out here. So yeah. it's, it's been great. Well, this gives you an even more special attachment to the park because you've actually done yeah. something. Because I can actually say this is part of what I help do. So it's, it'll, it's wonderful to just be out here, you know. All right, let's walk. Sure you We're going to walk over your bridge. <laughs> Don't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Watch out for the snakes. Watch out for the snakes. <laughs> oh, boy. We hadn't seen any snakes, and no, I think I, there are a lot of rattles. I saw one this morning. Did you see the coach whip along the road that we passed? No. Yeah, there was a, a racer, red racer. Here's one of the bars that... Uh, this is sort of like going to be like a texture bar so that when people are walking across here, if they uh, have visual impairments, they can't see very well, they'll feel this and they'll know okay. that there's something here. We'll have actually uh, cassettes with tapes on it for people who have trouble seeing. If they can't read the exhibits, uh, they'll have a tape, that they, audio cassette that they can use to learn about what's out here. And here's the trail. How long is the trail? It's roughly a quarter of a mile, about 1,300 feet. And what will they see on this trail? Well, various, uh, mostly plants, the desert plants. Uh, like over here, we have ironwood trees. 
which is a tree from the Sonoran Desert. What is this? A big one over here that looks dead? Well, that's a dead ironwood tree, but some of these others that you see over here oh, are alive ones, yeah. And they don't grow elsewhere in the park. They're only down in this part of the park. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to put a trail in here was to talk about some of the things that visitors don't see in the other part of the park. So this is truly a nature trail. Right. Uh, it's called the Bajada Trail. We're walking on a Bajada, which is a, a eroded material that's eroded down out of the mountains and has formed kind of like an apron across it that you can oh, see over look here at, at the this, base of the mountains. Look at this view. Right. Yeah, these are the Oricopia Mountains over here, which are actually outside the park. but. You can see the alluvial fans at the base of the hills, and that's what we're walking on right here, and that's why we call this the Bajada Trail. Boy, this is, well, you can't, Louie won't be able to see it with his camera, but there's the freeway right there. So the 10 freeway is just right here. Thousands of people pass by here every hour. Uh, tens of thousands of people a day. Uh, that's why we hope the trail is going to be a real popular thing, because it's just off the interstate. Okay, we're heading down the trail. And there looks like some activity going on down here. Boy, I tell you, here come two pioneers doing their thing. We're, we're, take, we're, we're taking done. it on. <laughs> Everybody's loaded. Boy, you're a, you got everything. Cool. <laughs> keep going, keep going. It, this is just great here. <laughs> You know, I feel guilty not carrying anything, Joe. Uh, you're carrying your microphone. I guess that'll have to do for yeah, now. <laughs> now, we're heading for a specific destination over here, but before we get to that, you were pointing out that it's not always this hot here, obviously. No, in, in the spring months when I suspect most of the visitors will be using the trail, it's really very delightful out here. Uh, the desert will green up a lot if we get any rain. A lot of these plants will start blooming, so... It'll look a lot, you know, a lot more healthy out here than it does right now. And this past spring was a spectacular spring. Uh, we had a great wildflower display out here this year. It really made us understand the value of doing this project when you came out and saw what it was like. Everything was blooming out here at All that time. All of this would have been in bloom pretty much, during yeah, the spring. Pretty much, yeah. Yellow, red flowers all around, so it was just, just beautiful. All right, tell us what's going on. Well, here's the outline of the trail right down here. Who are these people? Well, we have folks here from the uh, Youth Conservation Corps and some National Park Service employees who are actually helping with the, the really hard part of the construction here is the laying of the road oil, which will harden into a surface over which wheelchairs can, can ride. Youth Conservation Corps. That's right. It's a summer uh, work program in the national parks of uh, high school students, usually, who come out here and help us out with uh, various kinds of construction projects and so All forth. All kinds of good stuff. You bet. We really, who's in charge? We really put them to work. Uh, this guy right here. He's pouring something. Yeah. Oh boy, this is the glamour side of yeah. working in the park. This is the really tough stuff. Howdy. Hi. Tell us what's going on here. All right. What we're doing now is putting down the road oil. Uh huh. And uh, mixing it into the into the surface of the uh, trail. Uh huh. Once once we get it mixed with the cookie dough um, mixture. Let's see. What do you do? Just pound it down? No, what we do, what, what, what he's gonna do is grade it uh -huh. with the asphalt rake, and the final thing, we'll pack it with the roller. Now, I hear that you are quite the taskmaster out here. Uh oh, where you hear that from? <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. Well, let's get some. <laughs> Does he work you hard out here? Yeah, actually. <laughs> well, when you signed up for this, did you know what you were getting into? Not really. Yeah. Well, why did you join up? Um, something to do. Uh -huh. No, I'm, I've never worked with the park before and never actually traveled in the park before, so new experience. So what do you think about the park after your first couple of weeks working here? Um, it's hectic. <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot to see and do. Isn't oh yeah, there? a lot. A lot. And you all are making a real contribution. Can I get over here? I don't want to, boy, I don't want to step on your trail here. You having fun? Oh, always. Every, every day is a holiday. <laughs> well, now, are you part of the... I'm, I'm one of the adult leaders for the YCC. I, I hear, got you. I work seasonal maintenance with Joshua Tree on trails. I got you. And here's another student down here. You having fun? Yeah, every day. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking a little warm under there. Yeah, it's very warm. Yeah, but it's got to be rewarding, doesn't it? It does. It feels good when you can see that, you know, I did this, I helped make this trail, you know, it feels really good in the end. Yeah. Well, congratulations to all of you. 
Uh, this is good work that's going on out here. This is great work, yeah. I mean, this is work we really need. We've been trying to get this project done for a couple of years, and, and it all came together this year, and all these people are helping out. You know, we couldn't do it without them. Well, that's it. That's our visit to Joshua Tree National Park. Um, I guess this had to be the two of the hottest days of the year, but we came here and we had a wonderful time. This is indeed a, a real gem, a real treasure here in Southern California. The neat thing about it, of course, is that it belongs to every one of us. This is our park. And not only is it a place that is full of natural beauty and history, but there's a lot of human history here as well. And as we saw in these adventures, each one of these little segments, there are so many people out there who love this park and are willing to come here and volunteer their time and their services to make this a better place for all of us. So if there's a lesson to be learned, it's that this park is here for all of us to enjoy. Come on out, Joshua Tree National Park. It's beautiful all year round. Maybe you don't want to come out in August, but the rest of the year it is spectacular. Rock climbing, hiking, camping. It's a place that is filled with wonder.